live on Facebook in about 90 seconds. I'm going to open the show with this because it's funny. All right, shrinking your screen. in a minute.
All right. And take it, Gabe. All right. What's going on, everybody? I think we got that right this time. <laughs> It's a good thing this, mucro this microphone is mited. It's a good thing this microphone is muted because you would hear me saying some things. Uh, because in our efforts to promote this, right, you know, we get the, we get the slideshow going, and then Gabe and I are furiously working, you know, on computers over here, and then I'm sharing out the event to make sure people see it, and somehow I started. It looked like I was sharing out an old one for some ridiculous reason. And, uh, yeah, but caught it just in the nick of time. Uh, want to start by shouting out Gabe. Thank you. Have you been with me from the beginning on this? <laughs> I keep, man, this is the 13th time we're doing this. You'd think we would be professionals by now. Right? But you know what? Maybe it's because we're starting at like 8 o'clock at night when I've been working for, uh, I don't know, close to 14 hours already. It's, it's been crazy, but you know what? This is what it is. Uh, I also want to thank Frank for all of his great jokes and general generalized humor that we incorporate in the opening stuff. So thank you there. And I got to get back over here to the chat. Where's the chat? Bear with me. Bear with me. I got to find it because people are talking and I can't see them. Because I missed it. No, apparently I'm not allowed to look at that one. How about this one? Can I look at this? Where is it? Where is it? Here we go. Yeah. Because I need the chat. Because I need to talk to you guys. There we go. All right. Wow. Look at all these people chiming in. I can't read all that. That's too much. <laughs> Well, I want to thank everybody for joining. If this is your first time, uh, welcome. If you have come back, then clearly you found something worth checking out. We've got new stuff for you. Today, we're going to have guests. Yes, live guests. Uh, finally, after a year of doing this, Gabe and I decided, hey, guess what? It's called Whistle Kick Live. We should probably incorporate some more live elements. But you know what? We have the pandemic to thank for this. Why? Because if prior to COVID and I, I, if I had reached out to people and said, hey, we're going to do this show and you're going to come in via Zoom and we're going to talk live over Facebook, people's eyes would glaze over and they just, Arr. what? But now everybody uses Zoom like 24 hours a day, so we don't have to worry about it. Oh, you know what? You know what I didn't do? Here, Gabe, switch off for a second. I want to get the, uh, switch over. Yeah, switch to Matt's first thing and we'll come back and I'll. Because I want to, want to. There we go. All right. So here's a question from Matt. Shout out to Matt. Which martial arts weapon would you choose during a zombie apocalypse, and why? <laughs> I'm I'm wearing a zombie mask. Isn't this the best? This was a gift. I didn't even have to buy this. People bought this for me. Isn't that cool? The zombie mask. I'm hoping you can hear me. I'm not going to keep this on all, the whole time. This is ridiculous. But I think it's pretty appropriate. This thing is not... I hate, I hate wearing a mask. I'll wear a mask. I'm not, I'm not objecting to wearing a mask other than I hate wearing a mask. So what martial arts weapon would I choose during a zombie apocalypse and why? Um, well... I think it depends on what your definition of zombie is and how they're killed. Okay. If you watch most zombie movies, they seem to have a distorted view of what would happen if you stabbed someone in the head. All these people with a knife jamming it into somebody's head and then they just pull it right back out. Uh, I've seen plenty of people who can't pull a knife back out of a stake, let alone someone's skull. So I think that I would be looking for a blunt weapon so it wouldn't get stuck. Um, what's the closest thing to a baseball bat in traditional martial arts? That's what I'm looking for. Not a sword. Not a sword. 
We've got some answers, though. Matt said, suiting I comment first, I have a solid pair of collie sticks I'd use. Just the right size and weight to do some damage and not break. Andrew says, staff, it's super easy to find new ones if it breaks. I want to make sure I have continued access to it, and the ability to find or make a new one would be key for me. Not thin pencil staff. Standard Japanese traditional kabuto staff. And that's probably the closest thing to a baseball bat. You get range, you get solid, and uh, we get some exploration of that in The Walking Dead. Gabe says, I'm not proficient in many weapons, but I think I would choose a sword of some kind. I played baseball for many years. There you go. So I'm comfortable swinging something. I know a sword is not a bat. <laughs> if you've seen the movie Bench Warmers, that's why I'm laughing. Don't chop at it. It's not a sword. You're not a sword. Anyway, but who's going to critique my form in a zombie apocalypse? You know what? Somebody would come out of the woodwork and critique your form in the middle of a zombie apocalypse. You'd be in the middle of defending yourself and somebody would pop out of a tree and say, that's not how I was taught how to do it. Uh, and Jason says, easy. But I'm not really sure what the response is. So I'm going to... Oh, is that is that... This is what Jason wants? Okay. Is that a martial arts weapon? Because that looks like something that a Klingon would throw around. All right, I, got, I got to take this mask off. Is that seriously? Jason, I want to know what kind of martial arts weapon that is because that, that that looks like somebody took several swords and put them together. It's kind of crazy. If it if it has to be based on martial arts and not reverse engineered from the future, okay, so I wasn't entirely wrong. Then it is a retractable flail battle axe. That's a thing. I know what a battle axe is. I know what a flail is, but I don't. I don't think flailing a battle axe around is something you're going to do too long. I'm watching the time because we have guests. Everyone learns differently, especially when it comes to learning a new form. What works best to learn a new form for you or your students? Doing it together, watching a video of it, reading through the moves, or something else. Okay. So I have spent enough time teaching that here is the method that I use and I will all but guarantee that if you implement this method, teaching forms, I don't know how well it's going to translate over Zoom, but in general, in person, it would probably be still better than other methods over Zoom. If you use this method, I will all but guarantee you success. So start the form, you do your bow, whatever. You do the first move, just the first move. Then you do the first move like five times. Then you add the second move. So if we number the movements, one, two, three, four, okay? I'm doing one, 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 two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And you don't pause. You don't need to stop and ask people, are you getting it? Because they will. You don't need to take a break and explain what the techniques are doing, because that's irrelevant at this point. You're talking about learning the fundamental movements in such a way that they remember it, and then you can build on top of that. You can't teach application to someone who doesn't know a form, right? It's better that they learn it roughly, and then you add on. And you just keep doing that. And within 10 minutes of that, you could teach someone an entire form. It works. Try it. But let's see what other people have to say. Matt says, when I teach, I tend to talk through the move as I demonstrate to try to reach more people. And yet, some people learn audibly, some people learn visually, 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 some people learn kinesthetically, right? Touch. And it's important to engage all of those things. And that's where they're watching you, they're doing it with you, and they're hearing you count the movements. In fact, some of them might hear you counting the movements in their sleep that night. Jason says, I used to just drill until memorized, but fortunately I picked up a book and learned about different learning styles. Once I know the student's primary learning style, I tailor to what fits them best. That said, when I moved to a rotating curriculum, I made sure the movements from the forms were in the techniques we practiced as a warm up during that rotation. Also, everyone has access to everything. So even though a student may be a kinesthetic learner, I give them the written verbiage. If the student is visual, I make sure they also hear the movements as they see them. So for me, it's about a custom solution for each student and involving as many senses as I can during the learning process. 
Stacy's in the chat asking where these other comments are coming from. These are in a private document. This is this is back end whistle kick live stuff. Gabe pulls these together. Uh, if you are in various whistle kick pages, you might see some of these. Uh, we get some comments from Mar Martial Arts Radio page. We get some comments from the um, the whistle kick live event pages. So that's where you're looking. Okay. Oh, it's been a long day. Oh God, I just almost had a legitimate spit take. <laughs> if you are not watching, you're missing the fun on this. Uh, it's a it's a side by side, and on one side, it says drilling moves on my good side, and it's Iron Man, and on the other side, it says drilling moves on the opposite side, and it's the most budget at home Iron Man made out of construction paper and packing tape that you could ever imagine. And it's, it's pretty darn good. It's pretty solid. See, when we do stuff like that, if you're if you're someone who's just listening, you got you to gotta check it out. You got to check it out live. First Tuesday of the month, 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time on Facebook. I'll have it up tomorrow night on YouTube. But, you know, those of you checking out the audio, you got you to gotta get with the program, man. <laughs> Tony's in the chat saying that picture is great. We got some quite a bit of feedback in the chat about the about the learning different learning styles. People really talking about what works for them and what works for them teaching, and I I, I like that. You know, uh, we're never going to be able to fully integrate everything going on with the chat with the show, and that's good. I would how how great is that, right? We've got this kind of back channel, people talking with each other, hanging out. I dig it. I really do. Cool. All right, next. For anyone who was training 19 years ago, how did your school or the martial arts in general respond to the events of 9-11? Excuse me. I've, I've told this story a couple times on martial arts radio. So for those of you who know me well and know my martial arts history, you know that I had a two-year span where I had my own school. And it happened to overlap with 9-11. I was walking from my apartment to where the school was. It was in a fitness center and it's about a block. And I was there, I was probably getting my paycheck or something because we ran the business through for insurance purposes. So I got my paycheck and the owner of the gym is watching TV in her office, just crying. I was like, what? Irene, what's going on? She told me what was going on. Now, by that time, um, the first two, Right, so it was it was the towers were the first two, and then it was the Pentagon, and then it was the crash in Pennsylvania. If I'm remembering my history right, just the towers had been hit at that point. And so as I walked back home, I passed the local newspaper, and they hadn't heard about it yet. So uh, one of the, I mean, joke is the wrong word, but one of the anecdotes I like to say about 9/11 is that I literally broke the story to the local paper. Um, wish I hadn't had to. Wish it wasn't a thing. And so, what's going on? We we got. Uh, you can feel free to check the chat, see if see if he's in there. Should be here. No, nope, not yet. Okay. Now, well, hopefully, he shows up soon. Oh. If he doesn't, we'll figure it out. We got this. Oh, this is a good one. So Matt wrote this in. If you can't tell, Matt chimes in a lot. And part of that might be that Matt is killing it as a stay-at-home dad. Props to you, dude. Not a lot of guys pulling that duty. And, oh, there he is. Okay. Um, and I, I really I really respect that. I got a lot of respect for that. And it frees up his wife, Jenny, who is helping out with a lot of book-related stuff on the background. And if you don't know, Jenny is the one who actually wrote the first draft of the Martial Artist Handbook. But you can still get it's still on Amazon. If you want autographed copies, they're well, that bookshelf, the top, you can't see it, but they're up there. All right, so great question from Matt. What new drills did you pick up during your time distance training or on Zoom or whatever 
that you plan to keep when this is all over? Ooh, this is a good one. I like this. Because let's face it, plenty of us have have poo-pooed online training and, and all of that for a long time. But what we're finding is that it's another skill set. And the schools and the instructors that are learning to adapt to that are actually becoming better instructors. They're getting, if you're someone who, who corrects only physically, you probably had a really hard time. Now you had to use your words. And now you're a better instructor because you have that skill set. So other responses, uh, I'm assuming this is you, Gabe. Having limited room for Zoom classes forced us to adjust drills to the smaller spaces, and we're definitely keeping some of that. Doing more in less room is a good challenge. I completely agree. Because let's face it, you get new in altercation, which, you know, at least somewhere along the way, we should be able to correlate at least some of what we do training to the real world. Could be in a tight space. You might not, if, if you don't have room to run, there's a good chance you don't have room for, for much else. Ooh, look at all, I, I, can't, I can't even follow. There's so much going on in the chat. Jason says, I am planning on keeping the online virtual in general. Regarding drills, I had seniors who were in the Navy, so they had given us drills to do in a small space. One example was forms in a box. You stand in one place and jump in place into the next movement of the form. Ooh, I like that. Apparently, I was being too inquisitive one night when a teacher introduced dragon forms in a box. This is where we have to do a mid-air front snap kick before each move. Ooh, spicy. I like it. <laughs> and he's here, so let's bring him in. It's good timing. Our first ever guest to Whistle Kick Live, someone that, uh, if everything goes well, I think you're going to get to know pretty good uh, over the next couple of years. So let's welcome Justin Lee Ford. Ju Justin, can you hear me, man? Yes, sir. All right. Good, good stuff. Uh, not yet. We're getting there. Okay. We're getting there. Here, let me. I'll do it. There we go. All right. I don't. I don't see you. Do you have? You have video? Should have video. There. Here it comes. There you are, man. What's going on? What's going on? I'm doing great. How about you? Welcome. Welcome to Whistle Kick Live. You're the first live guest we've ever had on this show. Thank you. Yeah. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. Yeah. Hey, when, when Gabe said, who are we going to bring on? I said, you know, we gotta, we, we gotta think about what, what do we need? We need people who are going to show up. We need people who are fun to talk to. <laughs> and that was it. Those were the criteria. People, who's going to show up and be fun to talk to. And, uh, and I thought, you know, we always have a good time talking, talking about this project that we're working on, that we're, we're actually not, we've talked about it a lot and we can tease it a little bit if you, if you want, uh, but we're not, this, that's not what we're going to spend the time talking about. Um, tell you what, let's, let's save that. Let's save that, that dangle that we just did, that little, that little hook. We'll save it. We'll save it for the other side. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, I, I like, I like teasing. I like I like maybe, oh, Jeremy, tell us now. No, I'm not going to tell you now. You got to wait. But the thing I wanted to bring you on to talk about, you're doing something that a lot of people have not had the chance to do. You are, you are working on building a school from scratch that's not yours. Yeah. Like talk about a, a really unique situation. And so the reason I wanted you to come on and talk about that for a few minutes was you've got all the challenges of being an employee and getting stuff going, you've got the responsibility of doing that, but you don't have the really the full authority. Even if even if the school owner says you have full authority, you don't. So, tell us. Why don't you start telling us how did that opportunity pop up for you? Because there might be some people watching who are thinking, "Oh, that's a thing. I want to do that." Yes. 
It is, absolutely. Oh. Mm. That's really interesting. And, and I, I want to say, I, I don't want anybody to think like I'm ignoring you. We had some audio stuff. Okay. People saying they can't hear you, and I'm not, and I'm not sure why, because it's it's kind of cranked up on my end. Um, I here, I'm just I'm just gonna jack the audio up, and we're just gonna see what happens. And you know, maybe this is something we. I thought we had this dialed in, but maybe we don't. So keep going, man. Keep going. This might help. It could also create an echo. We'll find out. Yeah, yeah. We're we're just gonna we're just gonna keep doing it. Keep doing it. What were his concerns for you? Like, what questions? What did he have to say? Okay. And so now that we've set the stage, how has it gone? Okay. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. All right. We're keeping these segments short, so we're going to drop to the teaser in a second. But 
before we go there, what, let's say you've got someone who wants to teach, they want to get experience teaching, they don't want to open their own school, and maybe this opportunity doesn't pop up out of nowhere. Any advice? Sounds good. All right. Well, for for people who are watching, listening, unfortunately, we got something audio wise we got to figure out. I don't know what's going on there. And so my apologies to everybody. Uh, we tested this. We tested it. I promise. Gabe's nodding. We tested this. We did all this and it worked. We even put up a Facebook event that was like, don't watch this. And people watched it and, and it all worked. Oh, I'm so frustrated because I know. I know. Well, we're gonna means we're gonna have to have you back on, but um, what's the thing we're working on together? In in six words, what is the thing that we're working on together? It has to be exactly six words. Super vague. Try again with a little less vague said epic new stuff for martial artists. I want less vague. Okay. Reading material for reading material for martial artists everywhere. All right. We'll take it. We'll take it, man. Sounds good. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for, thanks for joining. And, uh, We'll talk again soon. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye. All right. So I want to apologize. I don't know why that's not working. We're going to figure it out. We iterate. Um, we're going to keep going with what we're doing, but as you can imagine, I'm racking my brain right now to figure out what the heck is going on there. Uh, I've got some ideas. No, that's not going to do it. That's not going to do it. I don't know. I don't know what else could do it. I don't know how else to do this. We're going to figure it out. Um, Gabe, knowing that we're not going to have anything to change, we should, why don't you... And Andrew's in the chat, isn't he? Andrew, I think we're going to bump you because I want to get this right. If knowing, knowing that that did not go well, we clearly have to do more testing on it. We will for next time. We'll, we'll, we'll get it right. Um, I'll give everybody their money back. <laughs> hey, if you expect the most polished professional show for you to watch on uh, Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, you shouldn't be tuned into some guy in a spare bedroom. I mean, let's be real about this. This is this is low production value. We're doing what we can with... I've got... I've got... This webcam I've had for like five years. The, the webcam up there that I used for Zoom... Uh, I don't even know how old that one is. You know, so... Apparently, I sound super clear. Well, that's exciting. Oh, somehow Lessie took over. M oh, that's what it was. No, I don't. I don't think it's a mic thing. Um, but uh, Lessie, I appreciate you chiming in. I, Lessie, I didn't realize your 
your dialog box in Facebook popped up over the chat. So all I was seeing was your messages. So I thought that was everybody. I just, I need another screen. We need a third screen or something. We need a second screen for the laptop next time. <sighs> is it hot in here or is it just me? Oh yeah, I'm wearing a hooded sweatshirt. Good job. What's it say? It says 72. Over the summer, it gets close to 90 recording episodes in here. All right, let's switch. Story time with Matt. We got two stories today. Matt's been getting us stories from people that he knows because martial artists have the best stories. Jenny says the unpredictability is what makes this show great. You need to put together a blooper reel. The whole thing is a blooper re reel, Laura. My life is a blooper reel. That's not entirely true, but it's fun to say. Uh, poor Jeremy. What else are you guys saying? I miss so much. Uh, uh, yeah, nobody can hear him. All right. Well, you know, we tried. Thank you to Justin. We'll bring him back. And I'll ask him different questions. And uh, we'll just leave it there. All right. I'm ready for some stories from Matt. When I was a blue belt, my instructor decided to put a board up for my jumping front kick in the middle of the form. I caught the back of the board on my instep and split my foot. For the next few years, if I tan the top of my foot looked for the next few years, if I tan the top of my foot looked like a sunburst, almost like a pow in a comic book. Please tell me there's a picture of that. I really want a picture of that. That'd be solid. All right, what's the next one? So Gary, Dan, and I were all super close friends in and out of class. We were doing forms and three to four people, excuse me, were trying to distract you or mess you up. All verbal distractions. Gary was doing his form. I remained quiet till the end. As Gary was almost finished, I shouted, Dan doesn't love you anymore. Gary dropped to his knees in laughter. I think I won. You know, it's a fun story. And... It's something that I don't think we talk about a lot. We don't talk about performing under the pressure of, of distraction, of noise, of too much or too little stimulus. You know, we tend to be pretty consistent with our training. And so the more you can mix that up, I think the better, the better it is, the better it goes. Ooh, this is a good one. If the integrity of the arts is maintained, do you think it's possible to over-commercialize the martial arts? I'm thinking. If the integrity is maintained, so what might a really commercial martial arts school that has a lot of integrity look like? Let's say the, the, the curriculum's good and standards are consistent, but there are you know, 10 classes running at a time in this huge facility and multiple locations and there are office managers and all these traditional business entities that you might not be used to in a martial arts school. I say yes, because I think it was last episode, we talked about what were the episode before, what it would be like if you had like a billion dollars to throw at martial arts and, and almost all of you said, I'm going to build the biggest, coolest school ever. Further explanation of the question. Like if Gichin Funakoshi or someone like him were alive today, would he advertise on social media, offer promos for new students, or host big public tournaments and events? Maybe I could ask it like this. Does having a commercial aspect necessarily or inherently detract from the t integrity or tradition of the art? Jason says, inherently, perhaps not. But I think it goes to the motivation of the person. I've experienced this on both ends of the spectrum. From the instructor who says, I will teach you everything there is to know about the start and never accept a dime from you. To, you cannot participate in sparring unless you purchase the gear that has the school logo on it. Matt says, now I understand, I think, with the world the way it is now, being the age of social media, I think we'd end up seeing more aggression between styles and people with uniformed opinions on martial arts as a whole. It would start turning into whatever it takes to get likes. Ooh. Yeah. You know... This is why I'm so 
free market when it comes to martial arts. Because the deeper we go down this rabbit hole, the harder it is to draw a line. So tell you what, you do your thing, I'll do my thing, that person over there will do their thing, and let the best school win. Leslie's in the chat saying, for what it's worth, I was in Okinawa and even some very traditional, old-fashioned schools had social media and some of the modern trappings. <laughs> there are things being said in the chat I'm not going to repeat. Glad everybody's in here. This is cool. Having fun. They say coffee is an acquired taste. If you like that sort of thing. What aspects of the martial arts do you enjoy now that you didn't at first? Oh, oh, this is... Gabe, did you come up with this? This may be the best question ever. This is an... No, seriously. This is an awesome question. How many people are going to say, I didn't like forms and now I do? Or I didn't like sparring and now I do? I did like basics and I still don't. No. Um, if it is done... If it is fun to do, if it's done fun with fun people, I'll do any aspect of martial arts. I like basics. I like forms. I like sparring. I like self-defense. What I don't like is when it's exclusively repetitive. You know, like we're going to do 20 minutes of step and punch. That's going to get boring. Not because I dislike doing basics but because I think there's a I think there's a there's a limit right Matt says I'm still not a huge fan of doing forms but now watching forms is amazing I love seeing the beauty in the different styles and can appreciate it more hmm. Ooh, Jason if I can flip the script a bit a thing I enjoyed at first that I dislike now is belts soon I will enact my master plan to eliminate all the belts <laughs> well, I've I've gone on record to say that I'm I I think there's a good chance belts go away in the next twenty years. That or we're gonna have to figure out a completely different way to do it. This is where we were going to bring Andrew in. Andrew, thank you. I appreciate your willingness. We're gonna bring you on next month. But here's the thing. So here's what was supposed to happen. We were supposed to bring Andrew on and talk to him about him coming on and helping with martial arts radio andrew is co-hosting a couple episodes a week uh, a month with me now a couple thursday shows because i want some help and i wanted to bring in a different dynamic and andrew and i are friends and he's a great guy and he's enjoys talking martial arts so i mean what else did we need and so this was going to be his introduction to the wider community in doing that and of course, he's been on martial arts radio and he's been around, but now I'm kind of bummed. So I'm, I'm bummed and apologize to Justin that we got the audio wrong. And I'm bummed and apologize to Andrew for bumping you because let's face it, neither of us are pretty enough to pull off just being on screen and people not hearing us. There's a reason that I do a radio show and not a video show. I got a better voice than I have a visage. And that much uh, uh, shiny head on screen at the same time, because Andrew has less hair than I do, it's, it's a lot. People might not be able to handle it. <laughs> Bless he's in the chat. Andrew is awesome and an asset to the Whistlekick community. Couldn't have said it better myself. Let's talk martial arts cinema. Martial arts movies, cinema, film, moving pictures, motion pictures. Those are pretty much dead right now, aren't they? Do you think the use of stunt people, green screens, or wires affect how non-martial art, martial artists view martial arts movies? Yes! Yes, I do! People assume that if you can do that, hey, we've got a picture-in-picture -picture going. Did you do that intentionally? Did you see that? The zoom, the zoom camera is still going. So when you switch over, I'm still in the corner. 
It's not a bad thing. It's just we we now we have picture in picture. See, season two, we bring you picture in picture. We're constantly developing new technical uh, sophistication by accident. Do I think it impacts people's opinions? Yes. Art imitates life, but life also imitates art. And the more that you are subjected to something, the more you're going to normalize that body of work or evidence of, uh, or perspective to see or, or to assume this is what it is. If you see a bunch of people fighting violently, you on TV or in movies, and that's being called a karate class, you're going to assume that's what a karate class is. But if you attended the average karate class, you would assume it was a thing only for children. By numbers, children make up the majority of martial arts participation, at least in the U.S. I can't speak globally. So we've got to We've got to make sure that we're getting out there, that we're communicating. This is martial arts. I am a martial artist. This is what we do. It's not the new Mulan movie, which I have not seen yet because I wasn't spending $30 on it. Not because I didn't think it was worth $30, but because I figured I'd just wait. Now, if I had a bunch of kids and was used to going to the movies and dropping $75 be a bargain. And I know plenty of people who bought the movie that that way for that reason. Stacy says, as long as you're looking at it as a separate movie versus a line for line recreation, it's great. It's much more believable to me. Some fine inside nods to the original as well. Okay. I have not seen the animated Mulan. I, I missed out on a lot of the, the, the Disney stuff. It just, it's not what I, I didn't watch it as a kid. What are your thoughts on Cobra Kai as a series and compared to the original Karate Kid? Well, <laughs> Stacy's telling me to, oh no, who are you talking to? Anyway, I'm not going to try to figure out a, a thread of conversation. It's probably directed at me. What are your thoughts on Cobra Kai? Um, there's a lot of little homage things in Cobra Kai. One of my favorite things is the way that they use the old footage excuse me, from the movie. They show what happens. And my guess is as we go forward, we're going to see more and more as that story progresses. Because I think that's important. I think we'll see it. And shout out to the team at Cobra Kai. Uh, John Hurwitz was on Martial Arts Radio. Big ups to him and the rest of his, his people. You know, season three is coming in January. Season four has received the green light. And so I want to thank all of you. I want to thank the world. Because I've been, I've been pretty blunt over the years that, you know, it's not too often that we get a piece of martial arts television or martial arts movie, a true martial arts movie in, in the United States. And when we do, we tend to trash it. Into the Badlands was a great show. And I saw more criticism of it than I saw praise. Warrior is a fantastic show. Saw almost nobody talking about it. But I think there's a season two. I think that got approved. And here we have Cobra Kai. Why is Cobra Kai being so universally accepted? Because it, there's some, some reminiscing going on. There's some, uh, there's some tribute. And if you have a martial arts school, and you are not leveraging Cobra Kai to bring in new students, you're missing the boat. I'm not saying you have to do hokey things, but there's a reason that that show hit number one on Netflix very quickly. Everybody watched it. So keep that in mind. Jason says, loving the show and excited to see where it goes. Also hoping I can see at least a few episodes before my Netflix trial ends. <laughs> Compared to the original, I guess I would have wanted to see more of Johnny's side. I'm also fairly certain that Johnny said, you're all right, LaRusso, at the end of the original. So I guess I thought there was going to be a moment like in Best of the Best where Dehan apologized to Tommy and we see them fighting together in the next movie. Uh, well, Jason, moving forward into season two, you see a lot of Johnny's personality. You you really 
um, see his personality, you see they do a good job of shifting around and, and you're not quite sure who to root for. And I really dig that about the show. Stacy binged all of Cobra Kai in September. Matt agrees Into the Badlands was amazing. Season two of Warrior just started. Oh, cool. Okay. I'm going to I'm gonna have to make sure I watch that. Pick your favorite end of the world movie. Put yourself in that movie as a martial artist. How do you fare? How do you affect the plot or outcome of the movie? Hmm. Favorite end of the world movie. Is it, is it I Am Legend? Because I don't think that's going to help me too much. Um, is it 2012? Because I don't think my martial arts skills are doing much there either. <laughs> Matt says, knowing or 2012. Unfortunately, I don't feel as if my skills would take effect. Not sure I'd notice the pattern in knowing. I haven't seen it. So it'd be boring. In 2012, I might only get a boat if they'd pick me to train new world military. Keeping my family alive might be a cool feat cinematically as the world crumbles. If Zombieland counts, you know, it's funny. I love that movie. I don't consider it a world movie, but I guess it really is. That'd be my favorite, and I'd do great. I'd have l less one-liners, but I'd be fun to watch. I'd train those I keep with me. Stacy says, I'm eaten alive by the bugs. <laughs> I totally see you going crazy on those bugs. Wreck it Ralph style, says Gabe. And he... We got we to throw that over there. There you go. <laughs> Found a Wreck-It Ralph gif. That was a fun movie. I'm not a big Sarah Silverman fan. And it has nothing to do with martial arts, but it's a fun movie. And then what was the next one? Ralph Frex the Internet. That one was less good. <sighs> this is tiring. I don't think you guys understand. I start my day doing this with First Cup. And I work and work and work. I went for a walk. That was nice. Got outside. It was 64 at its peak today, which um, I was talking to somebody in Texas. And, you know, they put on a jacket at that point. I was walking around in a teacher, but it's still, you know, it's, it's a long day. I sometimes use the analogy of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly to illustrate the struggle of growth Excuse me. in the martial arts. What analogies or metaphors do you like or use? Hmm. I tend to think of it as a path. I, I think the one that I use most is the idea of martial arts as a mountain. And that when you're in the bottom of the mountain, your martial arts could be completely different from someone else's. But the higher up you go, the more likely you are to be similar to someone else. And that, heck, at the top, and I'm not saying I'm at the top, but the closer you get to the top, the more similar it looks. Slow it down enough, it all becomes Kung Fu. And we're pulling out a graphic that I did. I mean, this goes back years and you know how I know? Look at the quality of the graphic. That's how you know I made it. Uh, shout out to Andrea who does our social media now and does a great, great job. This is back when I did the social media. And it's a top 10. You know you're a martial artist if. And I'll read them off to you. I've done almost all of these. Let's see. What ones haven't I done? You've ever shut an overhead cabinet with your foot? All the time. You've tried to catch a fly with chopsticks. I tried. I gave up. You've ever had a mock battle with your pets? Constantly. You know the exact time a fight scene starts in at least one movie. That one's not based on me, but that one is based on my interview with uh, Master Ken, a.k.a. Matt Page. Uh, what episode was that? 25, 27? And he mentioned that um, he knew the exact times of a few of the fight scenes of Van Damme movies on VHS. So we put that in there. Your friends won't let you play soccer anymore because you kick at the ball no matter how high it is. 100% that's me. Uh, I... I received yellow cards in middle school soccer for kicking at the ball. I didn't want to hit it with my head. I wasn't comfortable with that. In fact, I was almost given red cards for it. You're constantly volunteering to break everyday objects. Of course. Why wouldn't you? Everyone, number seven. Everyone you know avoids sneaking up behind you for fear of bodily harm. Uh, they learn quickly because, you know, they, they pop up and you pop into a stance and guards up and almost hit them. Every uh, Number eight, you've ever punched a bee? I've punched a bee. 
not like a bumblebee. Those are fun. Like, I like bumblebees, but like a hornet. Like, it's coming around you, and like, what are you going to do? You punch it. Maybe you can generate enough force to shatter its something so it doesn't sting you. Number nine, people have overheard you say, I didn't recognize you with clothes on to your martial arts friends. Yes, I've heard and said that many times. Number 10, you've ever been shushed in a movie theater for saying that wouldn't work? Uh, several times, uh, I believe Master Brennan Goodall uh, was with me. He's been on a bunch of times. I'm just checking the chat. The Planet of the Apes movies. Oh, that's a good one. Andrew's got an analogy, or, or yeah, a metaphor. Here is one I use. Learning karate isn't easy. If it was, everyone would do it. Right on. What else would you add to that list? And there is a second series. There's like 20 more, and we've gone on and done a bunch of singles, but I did the, the, the first two as sets of 10. Andrew says, your friends always, have, always save a seat at the restaurant for you, and it's always the one against the wall. I think that's in the second set. Gabe says, being married to a martial artist makes for interesting dates because whoever doesn't get that seat tends to be more on edge. You know what? I've learned if I'm in a group of martial artists, people that I, I, I like, I just, I get to put my guard down for a moment. How, that's such a cool feeling. If you're not used to putting your guard down, go out with a bunch of martial artists and just say, you know what? I'm letting my guard down. You all have to care. We'll do a couple more. If someone was going to write a comprehensive book on the martial arts, what technique, philosophy, or aspect would you want to make sure was included? Hmm. Well, for me, it's all the philosophy. It's it's the personal growth. It's the it's the betterment of yourself through discipline and training and sweat and adversity and all that. That's the most important part for me. Richard says, every martial art and practitioner deserves a reliable explanation of its history based on sound evidence and sourced research. The degree to which myths about body dharma and other nonsense pervade the arts is astonishing. Hmm. And for those of you that don't know, um, Richard's pretty passionate about martial arts history. He's been on martial arts radio and I believe he has a podcast. Gabe, doesn't he have a podcast? I think he has a podcast, Martial Arts History Project. Maybe somebody's going to remind me in the chat. My apologies if I'm getting the name of that wrong. I know there's a website. I know he's he's done a bunch of writing and a bunch of research, and I really appreciate the work that he does on that as on that in that respect. Uh, he was actually a candidate for bringing on today. Uh, we'll, we'll get him on the show at some point because uh, I got a couple questions I want to ask him about martial arts history. Jason says, I would want to see the anatomical or psychological kinesiologic, ooh, there's a good word, breakdown for each technique as well as the physics of executing each. Ooh. We'd have to, we'd have to do some measurements, take some angles. I like that. And we're going to call this one the last one for today. How do you help those students with performance anxiety? I can understand nerves on a test day, but I've seen students who never wanted to perform a kata, a form, or demonstrate even a single technique. That's tough. And I think you got to track back why. When people are anxious, it could be something as simple as they've always been able to skate by. People haven't forced them to do it. So they haven't developed that skill set, especially if it's somebody young. Or it could be based around some traumatic event. One of the things that people like about martial arts is that it's, especially class in a class setting, it's this kind of unique individual practice, but in a group setting. And so you can, you can kind of hide a little bit. And that's really important for some people. Some people really need that. But yet when we single them out, sometimes they, they have a hard time with that. Matt says, we hang flags on the front wall. We make the students learn what they mean. I'll go over to the flag and have the students take turns teaching parts of it and encourage them to ask for help if they don't remember parts. It helps build confidence and comfort with their peers. Helps remove the anxiety. Give them a training buddy. Have them do some one-on-one -on -one work without making them feel secluded from the group. Usually a higher rank non-instructor who has same detail issues. Two birds, 
one stone. Senior students help fix detail, realizes they need it too, fixes it. Yes, teaching something, you quite often realize, oh, snap, I've been doing that. I gotta stop doing that. The last one is tournament practice. Set up rings, peers are the referees, the judges. They don't, ah, they don't actually judge. <laughs> Gabe was scrolling too fast on me. They don't actually judge, but it gives them someone to make eye contact with during presentation. Gives them a partner if they need help getting through their form. Gives them opportunity to watch others also make mistakes. And you know what? I think that's a key. Or gives them a role model. There are many schools where the instructors act like they are perfect and refuse to show their vulnerability, their humanity in their movements, their forms, etc. And it builds an unrealistic expectation. If you are one of these instructors who refuses to show things unless they're perfect, ugh, stop. You're still learning as a martial artist, hopefully. That means you're not perfect. Let's show them that you're not perfect. Let's show them that you're constantly working to get better, but you never stop that work. Jason's got some thoughts. Kindness, patience, time. Rigorously apply those three elements repeatedly. Cultivate in your laboratory until a healthy culture of confidence begins to materialize. Then maintain the ideal environment for unrestrained potential and allow their inner spirit to emerge. Oh, and make a big freaking deal out of it when they do it the first time. Yeah, reward the behavior you want. Even if they make a small step, a little bit of progress, you got to cheer them on. We are their best advocates, their heroes, their fans, their cheerleaders. Don't underestimate the, the value and the impact that that has. Good show. Thank you everyone for rolling with this with me. Uh, I want to shout out Gabe. I want to shout out everyone who chimed in with quotes and thoughts. If you watch, you're going to see another event pop up. We're doing this. We're, we're making lots of little changes. You're going to see another event pop up. If you are in the season two, episode one event under whistle kick, it's, it's, the only whistle kick, actually there are two whistle kick events. The other one's training day, which is probably not going to happen. But if you, you jump in there, we'll put a post in bringing you to episode two and we'll do it again. The first Tuesday of the month, 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. So we're looking at November 3rd. Mark your calendars, November 3rd, 8 p.m. Eastern. Do your time zone, excuse me, do your time zone math if you got to. Oh, I'm burping. Brought to you not officially by Spindrift. Thanks for coming by, everybody. I enjoy doing this show. It's a lot of fun. And having this many people in the chat just means the world to me. So I'm going to go now. But I will see you in a month. Or maybe I'll see you for first cup in the morning. And if nothing else, I'll talk to you on martial arts radio or see you in social media. I'm all over the place. This is why I'm so busy. All right. Thank you. I appreciate you. Good night.